Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi Thank you so much uh, for uh, for still being here with us. Um, now our next session is going to be a little bit different. Uh, it's going to be a two-week interactive uh, discussion. Uh, on my right, I have um, Asan and Nas. Um, Married couple, uh, we've been married for uh, four years already. Alhamdulillah. Four years, Alhamdulillah. And uh, we have Aiza and Lev of Sheikh, and also El, uh, representing the single uh, men and ladies. Okay. Um, if you look at uh, in front of you, there's a number zero one eight two zero four zero four four one. I'm going to take some questions from the audience. If you have a burning question to ask, uh, just SMS. Uh, try to be short and concise. And um, after creating, inshallah, if there's time, I will try to uh, accommodate to all of the questions. Okay. Um, the first, uh, the first question that we want to elaborate today is about um, nafkah. Um, the question comes from the audience uh, several times. I think uh, it is one of the common issues faced by a lot of married couples, uh, not just the young ones, but uh, adults also. The question goes basically, I pay my own bills and toiletries, sometimes basic needs for my kids as well. My husband believes that since he pays for everything else, his obligation on NASCAR is considered time. Is this right? If you can elaborate on the question. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Salatu was salamu ala Sayyidina Mawlana Muhammad al Habib Rabbil Alameen. Wa ala alihi al Tayyibin al Tahirin wa ashabihi al Ghurri al Mayameen. Wa man tabi'ahum bi ihsan al Ayyumdeen. Summa Amma Ba'ad. So it's an important question. Uh, nafaka is upon the husband. So the nafaka of an abode, the nafaka of clothing, and the nafaka of food. All of these three are upon the husband. Now, matters of nafaka which are, other than this, are based upon the roof of people, what the norms of people are, uh, what the society dictates in the norms of the culture of those people, that's what uh, it should be based upon. Now, <coughs> if what the sister is mentioning in this question of uh, toiletries and uh, certain matters of her children that she pays for these are basic needs that the husband should also be providing these are basic needs that the husband should also be providing like we said earlier but if she purchases these matters from her own uh, wealth which does not impoverish her, nor does it, uh, it, it's not burdensome upon her, then she should do this out of her own free will and generosity. But at the same time, her husband cannot say that uh, this is an obligation upon the wife and not the husband, right? He has to acknowledge that this is his duty and that he has to acknowledge her favor upon him in providing those matters from her own wealth and accepting her generosity in this matter, right? So, from what I understand is the matters that the sister is mentioning are basic needs that should be provided for by the husband. Nevertheless, if the wife is paying for them, then she is doing a favor. She is not fulfilling her obligation. The obligation still will stay with the husband and not the wife. Yeah. Um, well, if we can look on the same topic in the... Uh... 
sorry. If we if we can look at uh, in the same topic but in a different um, context, perhaps, um, what is enough when we talk about NAFCA? Uh, for example, if let's say a couple, uh, your wife asks for a pair of clothes every two weeks. Is that enough, or is it a monthly thing? Because we get paid monthly in uh, in, in Malaysia, or it's just once a year whenever it comes. So, how do you deal? Do you guys have any issues with that? Uh, <coughs> I don't think for now we can have that issue. But um, if she wants to buy a new clue, uh, I would like to check the board with her. It's full of a <laughs> lot of clothes inside there. Maybe I'm saying, okay, but you have a lot to wear. Uh, probably um, if for some certain uh, occasions where you know where you have a prior idea made or anything, then I would buy her hair. But uh, if she has uh, some other occasions that she really needs the clothes, then then we look at our financial status. Okay, uh, that depends. Uh, it's not necessary a no or yes. Depends on the situation for me. Okay, well, that is if she accepts uh, your or whatever that you have to say. But Shay, if I can ask you, for example, when it comes to food um, or even a roof as a shelter, um, can one uh, request or define, okay, for me, NAFCA as a minimum is um, a lobster once a month. Um, uh, there should be chicken on my uh, on the table every day. You need to provide that, and I don't eat normal rice, only basmati, for example. Okay. How do we actually put? Okay, the husband will say, okay, this is enough. Okay, what the fuqaha have said is that it also depends on the type of family that the wife comes from. If she comes from, for example, a very high class family, then he should be providing in as close as possible to what she had in her parents' house. As close as possible as what she had in her parents' house. Uh, that's number one. Number two, the, the affair of what should be placed, what should be on the dish every day or once a month, that again is something that needs to be mutually understood be between the spouses and not a demand from one upon the other. When it becomes demands, then it becomes like classroom rules that everybody hates to follow. Is that clear? Yeah, it's um, If I can go a little bit more uh, in detail, mm -hmm. for example, let's say uh, 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 child school fees, for example. Um, let's say the husband says, okay, just put, in this, uh, just put our kids in a public school uh, because that's part of uh, the obligation of the husband to provide. But the wife said, no, I want to put my kid in this uh, super expensive school because of the exposure, education, etc., etc. Um, and how do we deal with situations like that? So that's going to be based upon the financial uh uh, ability of the husband also if he cannot financially afford if he can give the minimum requirement of society in for example providing a roof food clothing education then he has fulfilled his duty right then as I said before that if the wife came from a higher class family then he must try to strive to give her as close as possible to what she had in her parents' house. But nevertheless, if he cannot do that, then she, sh she should have known from before her, his financial situation and then she has to compromise. Right? So for example, before marriage, either he told her that, look, I'm not as wealthy as you. Or she knows that he's not, he doesn't come from as a wealthy, uh, as a wealthy uh, family as she came from, right? So then she would have to compromise on those matters. If he is providing the basic by which they can get by, uh, more than that, then she, she doesn't have the right to, to ask for. So for example, in this case of he cannot afford a private school where he has to pay, so he sends to a public school which is free here or 
it's cheaper. Um, public school is much more cheaper. Cheaper, right, cheaper. right. So, um, he, if he cannot afford that, then he uh, ascending to a public school is enough, right? Then they would have to find, as parents, uh, supplements to strengthen the education of their children. Is that clear? Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, okay, that's, I think, uh, that's sufficient. Uh, These matters are very relative. These matters, they are not concrete. Uh, they have not been set in the law uh, as concrete matters. There's no blueprint in them. Uh, they are relative to people's situations and the urf of that culture. Is that clear? Yeah. Okay, um, you can move to the next question. Uh, let's move to uh, the couple. Uh, as like if you have, what would be your next, uh, your first question? So, um, Assalamualaikum. Yeah, my first question would be about addiction. Uh, just addiction in general, but uh, mostly in our society now, addictions are connected to uh, phones and social media. So basically, our phones are literally chained to our hands right now. And uh, whenever we wake up, um, the first thing that we would do is, uh, where is my phone, right? Uh, do I get any updates on Facebook or Twitter or whatever it is that you have? You and uh, the result of that addiction uh, is that you become disengaged with your, um, with your spouse. Uh, for example, if, if he or she is talking to you and you are busy with your Facebook, Twitter and so on. And how do we really overcome this addiction? Okay, so this uh, addiction of mobile phones and social media, it's, it's not in one domain of life. Right, I try to observe people in, in their works, in, 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 in different arenas of life. So for example, uh, you'll see people sitting in their offices, right, and underneath their office desk, they've got their mobile phone and they're checking, right? You'll see teachers, teachers in classroom, right, updating their Facebook accounts, when they shouldn't be. You'll see people driving their cars and their mobile phones are in their hands. Right, so it seems like this disengagement from society at large and engagement into mobile phones is not specific to marriage, right? But rather it's something which has become very generic. It's become in, in every domain of life. And this problem needs to be controlled. And it needs to be controlled by everybody in society. Right? Because of its evil effects upon society at large. So for example, I'm sure in this country also if you are caught using your mobile phone whilst driving, is that a fine? Yeah. 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 So most countries of the world now have very heavy fines for people who use their mobile phone whilst, they, whilst driving. But why? Because of the serious accidents that are occurring. People are actually dying, pedestrians are being killed, other drivers are being killed because somebody was on their phone updating uh, their Facebook or sending a message on WhatsApp. So we have to learn from the dangers of, of the mobile phone and engaging it. So whilst driving, we can potentially kill somebody or seriously injure somebody physically. Whilst in our homes, when we are upon our mobile phones, we, are, we might not kill somebody or seriously injure somebody physically, but without a doubt we will be killing somebody spiritually and mentally and seriously damaging them and harming them. Right? Seriously damaging them and harming them. And you know, uh, parents, husband and wife should look at the situation from their children's perspective. Most parents now complain that my, my children are... Actually, most parents don't complain. You know why? Because they're quite happy. <laughs> they're quite happy because they feel my kids don't disturb me no more. I buy them a tablet, a, these gadgets, right? And they sit in their bedrooms and get on with life. So we can enjoy our life as husband and wife and they can enjoy their life living with these gadgets until a time comes when 
when the kids become rebellious, the kids don't want to know their parents, then the parents get worried, um, Imam, my kids are not listening to me. Well, did you ever sit down to listen to them? Were they ever around in your life? Right? Uh, so this addiction has serious implications upon society and upon our relationships with others. Right? And that's what we need to understand. The only thing that will take this addiction out of us is knowing that we are seriously damaging another human being by disengaging that human being and engaging this machine. Right? And the closest of people to us are our spouses. Isn't that right? The closest person to you is your husband, is your wife. If you are giving priority to your machine, your mobile phone, your Twitter, your Facebook, your Instagram, your WhatsApp, if you are giving more preference to all of that than your wife, then you should expect that your bond will start to break. Your bond will begin to become weak, right? And when, when your mobile gives up on you, then by that time it's possible your wife would have given up on you too. Your husband would have given up on you too. So we have to understand the dangers of these machines, right? And personally, I, I, I would say that people should, uh, people should seriously discipline themselves, that whilst they are with their spouses in their homes, they should switch off their mobile phones. Seriously, they should just switch them off. And using mobile phones in front of your children only encourages them more to go onto the machines. Right? To go onto the machines and be disengaged from you as parents. Is that clear? Husbands need their wives and wives need their husbands. Children need their parents and parents need their children. What's coming in between is television screens, computer screens, mobile screens, tablet screens, 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 right? And we're ending up not living human lives, but we're living robot lives, right? So I think the most important thing is to understand that so long as I'm on my mobile phone, I'm damaging my husband, my wife. I'm damaging my relationship. Until we don't understand that we are causing this damage within our own homes, we won't stop using these things, right? And we have to discipline ourselves. And you know Ramadan is the best time to discipline ourselves. If we can discipline our stomachs from not eating and munching all day long, then I'm sure we can discipline our hands from not engaging with our mobile phones for the amounts of times that we do all day long. No. Come sit down. So, I mean, uh, patience is very important. And so, for example, if one of the spouses is addicted to their mobile phone, then the other needs to help them and needs to realize, okay, my spouse is in trouble. And the trouble that he or she is in is that he or she is addicted to the mobile phone. And then try to work out ways of uh, helping them disengage from it and engage with you. So if, there must be times when you sit and speak with each other then to kind of give hints and examples of other people whose marriages have been damaged because of uh, their addictions to mobile phones or give examples of people whose marriages have been successful because of the lack of addiction that they've had to mobile phones. And in, in the times that we live in, we can find lots of examples of people 
who, who, who keep away from technology, right? Who keep away from technology. I remember I was teaching a class, of, a Farda'in class, and there was two brothers. I think both of them were university students. And one of them at the end of the lesson, he asked me something and he said, I said to him, I'll send you an email, just check it on your phone. And he pulled out his phone and he it was a very old Nokia phone. Right? It was a very old Nokia phone. And he said to me, our mother doesn't allow us to keep smartphones. And they were university students. Right? So there are still examples in society of people who've kept themselves safe from indulging into smartphones and being constantly on the phone. Right? So to give examples like that to your spouse, uh, positive ones and the negative ones to really shake up uh, that person and make them understand that I shouldn't be going down the same route as so and so. Is that clear? No. Okay, uh, just before we move to Ellen, uh, um, if I may add a little bit more, uh, I'm a father of uh, my daughter's going to be eight and two weeks old, and I'm um, contemplating to buy uh, a new tab. If, uh, and my intention is. Are you speaking about yourself? Sorry. Are you speaking about yourself? Uh, yes. I am. Are you serious? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Um, my purpose is of uh, education and exposure towards uh, technology. I know it sounds a bit uh, weird, but um, I, I agree that we need to have some sort of control. But you mentioned earlier, I think during the second session, that uh, when it comes to our kids, we should, uh, we should, uh, it's damaging to actually expose them to the colors of the dunya, where a tech will actually do that. But how do we control our well, probably I will change my, my idea to have a, a tab. But in general, for everyone here, how do we control the content or uh, to balance between giving them the education of uh, technology and uh, for them not to be behind as compared to their classmates versus uh, the damaging that can uh, be imposed to the, the, the children? I was teaching a class, right? of teenagers and I was speaking about my children in my house. I have two boys. One is uh, five and one is six. So, so I was speaking about my children, how we don't have a television in our house. They don't have mobile phones. They don't have a computer. They don't have a laptop. They don't have any gadgets, ele electronic gadgets. I said, they they are extremely happy every day. They play with their toys, they play with their parents, and they're just happy. And one of the kids, teenagers in the class said to me, Ustad, do you give your children a tablet before they sleep? I said, no, they just go to sleep. Why do they need a tablet to go to sleep? So the other child, one of the other students clicked on that I didn't understand the question. He said, no, not a sleeping pill, he means a tablet. Oh, okay. So I thought that the kid meant, do you give your children a sleeping pill to put them to sleep? So I was like, why do they need a sleeping pill for? I didn't even know that this machine is called a tablet, right? So children don't need machines, they don't need gadgets, they don't need... All children need is their parents and love. That's all they need. They don't need a mobile phone. I don't understand how parents can give their children mobile phones. Seriously, it doesn't make sense. Why do... And then parents make excuses. Oh, what if any emergency happens? at school. They've got teachers at school. Their teachers would contact you, right? This is why you have the emergency services. You have the police, you have the ambulance, you have so on and so, right? So parents, and I think, uh, please forgive me, a lot of times parents buy their children all of these gadgets and machines to 
to so that their children can just be engaged with something other than them. So parents can go out shopping freely and you know do whatever they want to do and live their honeymoon life so long as these kids are just growing up and being taught by the machine and you know if if you don't make tarbiyah of your children and what type of tarbiyah you know when we say tarbiyah it doesn't mean you're teaching them formal adab and you know uh, giving them lectures and lessons no tarbiyah is when you are praying your children are seeing you pray they watch you pray right um, my, my son he's memorized two juz of the quran and he doesn't know how to read the quran just through play he memorized two juz and they enjoy it so much two juz of the quran he memorized just like this from the age of three and four playing around the house they we don't sit with them formally and teach them just through their play they memorize quran Right? And they don't have any gadgets. Sometimes I used to think perhaps I should buy them a machine or a gadget where they can listen to another Qari recite. So one day I put the laptop on for them, my laptop, and put YouTube on so they listen to the Qari recite. And I saw the kids were so distracted, it was unbelievable. So I closed it. I thought, you know, this way is not going to work. Right. Because they would want to jump from one video to the other, from one video to the other, because they can forward it and rewind it and move. So the child becomes distracted. Is that clear? So children don't need machines. And don't worry if your child is lacking behind all the other children in the class. Because they haven't really got something of advantage. They've got something that's just damaging them. Right. If your child is, if the progress of your child is slower, but your child is happy, your child is engaged, your child feels filled with love and affection, that's all you need. You don't need to follow the trends of society. Oh, my child doesn't have this, my child doesn't have that. They don't need it. Right. And sometimes what happens is in young parents like our age, if we missed out on things that our parents, for example, couldn't afford for us, we have this adamant nature in our minds. You know what? My parents couldn't afford it for me. I'm going to get it for my kids. Right? That's also detrimental. Why? Because then everything that we wished for as children or saw other children have, but we couldn't have, we just buy it and buy it and buy it for our children. Right? When in reality, they don't need any of that. They don't need any of that. Um, children just need their parents to live with their parents and take love from their parents and that's it. You know, uh, I went to a, a retreat just to visit Habib Qazim. He was in Wales. I took my children with me and when we got there, we met Habib and then at the end, the brothers offered some food to us. So we eat and then we leave. And it was a Moroccan dish. And it was bought in a big round dish. And there was about seven or eight of us. We sat together. And my children sat and they started to eat like everybody else. And one of my friends, Dr. Habib, he was there. He said, MashaAllah, your children are good. They, eat, they, they began to eat the food straight away. He said, we have children here who are so fussy. It's unbelievable. Every day they say, we want this food, we want that food, we want this food. That's because the parents have nurtured them in that way to make them fussy. But if you keep your children close to you, they eat the exact food that you eat. They eat the exact food. They never complain about food. Why should a child complain about food? It doesn't make sense. If a child is complaining about food, that means the parents are complaining about food. Right? So all children need is absolute love and affection. So I say that Ali radiallahu anhu said, Play with your children for seven years and then teach them adab for the next seven years and then befriend, befriend them after that. Yeah, be friends with them. After the age of 14, that's it. Your child should feel my parents are my best friends. 
But parents give gadgets to their children, those gadgets become the best friend of the children. And then the parents have their own best friends, which are their mobile phones. So everybody's living in their own world. You still gonna buy a tablet for your daughter? <laughs> You're lucky. <laughs> Based on, um, since uh, we've been talking about marriage, um, based on the book, etc., do you have that? Uh, what would be your question to say? Yes, Salaam Before my question to you, I would like to ask the audience a question, if I may. Okay. Um, have you guys ever made a pact with a friend that if you'd be single like 30, 45, 50, or any DJs that you just marry each other? Thank you. No? I guess I'm the only one here. <laughs> so my question to you would be, um, what is an unmarried to do? Um, do we just wait for the right person? Or do we just marry the person that we think is right? Or someone, other person suggests? Okay. <laughs> I mean, I think this is a, a global phenomenon now of how to find the, the right spouse. You know, previously people lived in small villages, small towns, uh, small cities where everybody kind of knew each other, at least on the same streets, in the same localities. So then they would, you know, the parents and relatives would help and find spouses. Now things are very different. People live like uh, away from each other and even if they are neighbors they don't really ever know each other and things like this so society is kind of uh, dismantled and really broken so it's become very difficult for people all over the world to actually find spouses I think it's important for um, groups like your group uh, this organization that uh, what's your organization called? today's Kawinke uh, Kawinke uh, to, to set up um, workshops and networks of people who, for example, potentially give their profiles to this organization and then they kind of find matches, uh, appropriate matches between people. Uh, so there needs to be some type of networking within communities and societies where people who want to find marriage can come and speak to somebody, give their profile in, uh, be able to see, for example, the profiles of other people and see if there's somebody compatible that they can find in society. Uh, what shouldn't be the case, I believe, is I'll marry anybody who turns up, right? Because I can't find a anybody who comes, I'll just say yes. That shouldn't be the case because uh, you don't want to end up in a relationship that you uh, don't like, end up in a relationship that's, for example, abusive, end up in a relationship that, you know, you uh, really hate what you ended up doing, right? So you should never jump uh, to conclusions, you should be patient, but at the same time, try to speak to friends, relatives, uh, imams in masjids, uh, people in, in, in the community who are highly respected and ask around uh, to, to, to see if there's anybody who's, who, who, who also wants to get married and then to see the compatibility between yourself and that person. Don't ever give up on this matter of being compatible with the other person, right? Just for the sake of marriage. Is that okay? Um. Uh, what is your point of view on halal speed dating? And this is not my question. <laughs> really? Don't worry, man. What are you scared for now? <laughs> this guy's frightened. And is such a thing as halal speed dating in the first place? So how does it work? Um, uh, I'm not so sure, but uh, one of my friends told me, I think. Uh, so, uh, the... The woman will come with a maharan or a friend from the city, and then, uh, the, well, to be honest, I have no idea. Uh, it's, I think during the, the speech,
keep dating, there's a maharam, not just two of them. And then they will just move to the next person, to the next person, to the next person. Uh, personally, I, I understand what you're saying. Uh, um, personally, I don't encourage this way. I rather encourage the first way that I mentioned, like reliable organizations like yours, what is it called? Cowin Care. Cowin Care. So reliable organizations like Cowin Care and other uh, reliable organizations to set up networks, right? Where they take profiles from people and then see where people are compatible with each other and get them into contact. Right. I prefer this than this speed dating thing, which has become very commercialized now. Right. And uh, I don't believe that that works as good as this, where you have reliable organizations and reliable people within the community who are striving to help people get married. And it's, it's a very difficult situation. You know, it's a very difficult situation. I have many people who come and ask me the same. You know, we want to get ma married. Do you know of any people? Uh, it's it's very tricky in our times. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have a question from uh, the audience. Um, Don't worry. I'm sure all of your questions are from the audience. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this is definitely. You're not going to uh, ask any of your own questions now. No, I'm not going to ask. <laughs> Based on what you have explained, uh, I am already over 50 years old, uh, never married, uh, received proposal of marriage but never want to consider because of my age. Uh, my question is, uh, is this thinking wrong or okay, or if this is the same as denying the sunnah? Uh, it depends why you feel your age is a barrier. It depends why you feel your age is a barrier. In reality, age should not be a barrier, in reality, unless, there, unless a particular individual feels that there are particular reasons why I shouldn't get married. There might be some personal reasons, there might be some medical reasons why this person feels that I shouldn't be getting married. So that's one thing. So I don't know why this person is saying that I, I felt my age is a barrier. So my first contention is that this person might have a personal reason, a physical reason, a medical reason for which they don't want to get married. That's legitimate, that's fine. On the other hand, if a person merely feels, oh, I'm too old and I won't find anybody, then I don't think they should think like this. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can send somebody to you at any age. Look at Ibrahim alayhi salam. He was so old when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him a child. When he gave him Ismail alayhi salam, Sayyidina Ibrahim was very old. Sayyidina Zakariya alayhi salam. He was very old when he had Sayyidina Yahya alayhi salam. But they never gave up. They constantly made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and said, رَبِّ لَا تَذَرْنِي فَرْضًا وَأَنْتَ خَيْرُ الْوَارِثِينَ O Lord, don't leave us all alone whilst you are the best of the inheritors. Right? So, uh, people should not make age as a barrier unless they have some personal reasons, medical reasons, physical reasons for which they're not getting married. Otherwise, they should not make age as a barrier between them and getting married. Because marriage is a, a very emphasized sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and of all of the Prophets and Messengers before him. And it's a human need. And it's a human need. No. So um, basically, uh, can I say that um, if you are healthy, like Aiza over here, there's no reason why you shouldn't get married. You should, as long as you're healthy, you should get married. Yes, that's the advice of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He met with a, a group of young men and he said, Ya ma'ashar al-shabaab, man istata'a minkum al-ba'ata fal yatazawwaj. O young men, any of you who is able to marry, then you should get married. And those who of you are not able to get married, then you should fast. Because fasting will break your desire and weaken your limbs and it will protect your purities. Okay, then, this is my question. Um, as a father, uh, 
is it my responsibility to look for a husband for my daughter? Uh, is it your responsibility? What I would say is that parents should help their children parents should help their children uh, in in finding in choosing spouses right um, why i'm not using the word responsibility is because if for example a child finds their own spouse then does then can the parents object and say okay no you can't marry that person because it's my responsibility to get you married so i'm going to get you married to whoever i want right so this is why i'm not using the word responsibility but what i would say is parents should try to help their children as much as possible you know i done a juma khutbah on this some months ago and i used the quranic verse in which allah azza wa jal he said وَتَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْبِرِّ وَالتَّقْوَى وَلَا تَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْإِثْمِ وَالْعُدْوَانِ Allah said, assist each other upon goodness and piety. And do not assist each other upon sin and transgression. And why I didn't khutbah on this was because sometimes some parents in some cultures, they want to force their children into particular marriages when their children don't want that, right? So this can lead to their children rebelling from Islam altogether. And whose fault will it be? The fault of the parents. Is that clear? So I won't use the word responsibility, but what I say is, parents should help their children, and especially in the society that we live in, children need help. Young people need help. They need people to be on their side, not working against them but working trying to work for them and with them no. yes yeah, you, you seem like you have something to ask mm -hmm. you know what I'm uh, okay you mentioned about uh, sometimes couple can have their own choice in choosing a spouse and if they found somebody that is they are pleased with the compatibility i mean in terms of financially uh, they are pleased with the character but what if the parents say no to the chosen spouse uh, because of nothing related to that uh, i mean should the couple uh, decide to proceed with it or what do you think that? okay so it depends why the parents are disagreeing with that marriage let's say it's about marriage uh, about lineage, okay. So, um, I don't know, I, I'm not a Shafi'i, so I think most people in Malaysia are Shafi'i. Yes. So I, I don't know the Fiqhi rulings concerning uh, lineage in the Shafi'i school, but from from my perspective of living in the West and the Hanafi school is quite lenient uh, in, in these affairs uh, what I normally say to I have cases that come to me of young people who say okay I want to marry this person but my parents are not accepting her parents are accepting or her parents are not accepting and my parents are accepting so I have many cases that come to me like this so then I, I speak to the the young people and I ask them if the reasons why their parents are not accepting. So once I've understood the reasons why they're not accepting, then I, try, I say to them, okay, is there any way you can speak to your parents? They've said, we've spoken. Okay, the next stage I will take them is, I will say, do you have any older brothers and sisters who are married? Or do you have any uncles or aunts that you are close to, who your parents will listen to? If they say yes, then I say, okay, go and speak to them and mention the situation to them and say, I need your help speaking to my parents, helping me resolve the situation, right? If that works, then fine. If it doesn't work, then I say to them, find the local imam of your masjid where your parents pray. If they respect that imam, if they listen to that imam, go and speak to him. Let's see if he can speak to your parents and uh, convince them, right? So there's, uh, I try to work in stages, 
I try to work in stages. Uh, if nothing works, if nothing works, then I want to see how adamant these two are in marrying each other. Right? How, to what extent will they go for each other? So for example, if their parents are not accepting but they still want to stay together, they want to get married, what extent will they go to in making this marriage successful without having their parents on their side? Right? If they are, uh, if, if they have enough finance, they are prepared to buy a house or rent a house and you know, work out their own way in, 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 uh, in making this marriage successful, then I would tell them to get married. Even without the consent of the wedding? This is what I was saying. In the Hanafi school, uh, there's a difference of opinion between the Hanafi and the Shafi school. I think in the Shafi school, they can't marry without the consent of the wali. Do you have any Shafi fuqaha here? Yeah, you all fuqaha. Man. Everybody's a mufti here. What's the opinion in the Shafi school? Okay. Yeah. I, I would do that. I would do that. In the Hanafi school, it's different. In the Hanafi school, uh, there are two rulings. The normal ruling, which is practiced by the Hanafi scholars, is that the woman needs the permission of the wali to get married. This is what is practiced. But the official opinion. But the official opinion of the Hanafi school is that the woman does not need the consent of a wali to marry so long as she is mature. Right? This official opinion was not practiced because in the previous times women would only marry with the consent of their wali. Right? But now in the times that we're living in, because things have rapidly changed, so in the West what we do is we actually follow the original opinion of the Hanafi school, right? And the reason behind that is, I said to the people in the Jummah Khutbah, I said, look, if you don't allow for your children to marry whoever they want to, then you will be helping them in committing haram. Well, and Allah says, وَلَا تَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْإِسْمِ وَالْعُدْوَانِ Don't assist each other upon uh, sin and transgression. But if you don't let them get married and they will stay in haram, whose fault will it be? The parents. No. Okay. Um, if I'm not mistaken, in, in the book uh, that is uh, mentioned about incapacity or you should not refrain a marriage unless it would, uh, about it mentioned about incapacity and also adultery. If it would lead to that, then you should just proceed like you mentioned. But what is uh, meant by incapacity? Maybe I... Good. Yeah, I'm not so sure exactly. I, I, I just wrote a uh, Nothing should prevent marriage except incapacity or adultery. In the book. Um, I'm not sure. Okay, it's okay. Uh, I'll try to ask uh, to get a bit more information on that. Okay, okay um, going back to the couple. Um, going back to the couple, uh, you're alone. Is she angry? Uh, no, I was saying that you were about to get addiction and food, etc. Um, what would be your uh, next question? 
As for jokes, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, uh, I, he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was uh, playful in his speech with his companions, uh, but he said, Wala aqulu illa haqqa, but I don't say except the truth, right? Uh, uh, as, so people should not say things that could potentially hurt their spouse. Right? So if they know that this is a joke which uh, my spouse will be fine with, then that's okay. But if it will potentially hurt them, then people should refrain from that. And um, as for being playful, then uh, that's left to your imagination really. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, just got a question from, uh, from the audience and I promise this is not my again. Uh, my best friend is a girl, but my wife says I am not allowed to be friends with her. Um, is that wrong for her to say that? Or, and what should I do? No, it's actually right for your wife to say that, because if you're using the word, she's my best friend, then your wife should have jealousy. She should have a ghira, right? Uh, over the husband, and the husband should have a ghira over the wife. Is that okay? So we have to be careful as to the words that we use for our friends in front of our spouses because for, for, for a husband and for a wife the best friend that they should have is the spouse right but if you're using that word for somebody else then of course it's going to erupt some some volcanoes <laughs> and when the lava comes out you're not going to be happy <laughs> right yeah I'll mention this now you said that you made a pet with your best friend, right? Yeah. Um, yes, I have my question. Um, I have a few friends that I'm close with, um, guy friends. So I have met them obviously before I got married, the guy I got married. So do I leave my friends just for this guy? So you have friends and now you're going to get married with somebody. Yes. So do you leave your friends? You don't have to leave your friends, but you have to be careful in the words that you use and in the way that you approach them. And uh, what you have to remember is your husband should have ghira over you, should have jealousy, right? And you should have jealousy over your husband uh, such that uh, those, then if, 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 if you are making mention of others in a higher regard than your spouse, that's obviously going to hurt your spouse, right? So you don't have to leave and abandon your friends and your colleagues totally, but what you have to do, you have to become more careful now that you are married. No. So this is that, um, I got a question from the audience. Assalamu alaikum, Jay. For working wife, what are the do's and don'ts uh, in their relation with non maghrab colleagues in office? Can they become friends and go out for lunch together or discuss about each other's private life aside from work? Does this apply in social media like Instagram, uh, Twitter and Facebook? Okay, very good question. So, uh, working women, and working men, right? So it, it's it's not one rule for women and another, another rule for men. The rule applies to both, right? So having relationships, friendships with the opposite gender should be very limited, right? So if you are colleagues in the office, you should just stay as colleagues, right? And that being a colleague has a, a sense of being a friend but it's very formal, right? And it should be kept to that formal stage and it shouldn't really go beyond, number one. Number two, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu said that it is haram for a person to expose his or her personal life with his or her spouse to anybody else. 
and this is a major problem in the times that we live in in the times that we live in is that women sit and gossip with their male friends and their female friends of her of their private lives with their husbands and husbands sit with their male friends and their female friends and gossip about their private lives with their wives this is absolutely haram and you know the case is becoming so serious recently I had a case that came to me where a woman she was divorced right her ex-husband was threatening her and saying to her if you do not say that the breakup of this marriage was from you then I will expose your private photos that I have you know when I heard that case that's when a verse of the Quran clicked to my head and I understood it crystal clear what's that verse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran either you keep your women your wives be ma'roof you keep them in your nikah with goodness or you let them go with ihsan with the highest levels of excellence you know the word tasrih do you know what it's useful tasrihan in arabic is the word that's used for combing the hair combing the hair so when you use the hair, a comb, you put it through one side and it comes out at the other end of the hair. Isn't that right? This is the word that Allah used for talaq, for ending a marriage. Why did he use this word? Because when you comb your hair, unless you have locks in your hair, the comb should go through your hair absolutely smoothly and come out at the other end without you feeling any pain. Without you feeling any pain, it should come out at the other end. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used this word for the ending of a marriage such that when the marriage comes to an end for whatever reason, it should come to an end in a way that doesn't harm either of the spouses. And then Allah said, Bi ihsan, with the highest levels of excellence. Where is the highest levels of excellence in this now? The man, ex-husband is saying, I will expose your private photos. Right? So it's become, society has become very dangerous. Society has become very, very dangerous. If that's an ex-husband who is saying that, then do you think people who are not even your spouses, just your friends, how do you know that they are not expo uh, exposing your stories to other people? And if you are showing them private photos, how do you know that they are not exposing them to other people? We've had cases where young people have committed suicide, killed themselves, committed suicide. Why? Because somebody that they had a relationship with exposed their private photos. Right? So we live in a very dangerous society, a very dangerous world. If you have colleagues at work, Keep them as colleagues. Don't grow a relationship with them. Whether this is for men or for women, it's the same. You've got your wife at home, you've got your husband at home. Make your relationship with that person. Make that person your best friend. Go out for dinner with that person. Speak to that person. Play with that person. Don't find others. You can, how will you trust what that other will, will keep of yours as private? You can't. We have to be very, very careful in the times that we live in. The times that we live in are extremely filled with fitna. Heavily filled with fitna. Right? So people should... Um, and it's very difficult to find a true friend in these times that we live in. Very difficult. People will give you lip service, but when it comes to the crunch, they'll disappear. Nobody will be there for you. You will have to swim in the deep waters all by yourself.
everybody will turn away. And this is known. You know, loyalty in friendship is very difficult. Loyalty in friendship is very difficult. And especially in the times that we live in, when we live in a time that there is no such thing as loyalty. There's no wafa left in our times. And the Prophet said, Al wafa min al iman. Loyalty is a part of iman. No. Well, um, talking about divorce, it is allowed by Allah. Yes. If let's say um, uh, it happens, how do we know if it's a blessing or a punishment? And how do we actually, if it, uh, how do we actually um, accept that and we suffer and and? Uh, Okay, so divorce is something which is legislated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because at times we begin things but we don't know what will happen tomorrow. Nobody knows what will happen tomorrow. Isn't that right? Huh? Today the marriage might be fine. Tomorrow things might go wrong. Two years, ten years, fifteen years later, people's minds might change, their character might change, their behavior might change, their compatibility might change. So hence Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed a release out of this relationship through talaq so that people can live in comfort, people can live in ease. So nobody really knows what will happen later on in life. So for that reason Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kept uh, this ending of marriage through talaq within our religion and it in and of itself is a blessing right it's a blessing why because we know that if things go wrong then I don't have to suffer in this marriage is that clear whereas in, in certain other religions there's no notion of divorce so what happens when things go wrong and there's no more com compatibility uh, and things break down, that's it. The woman just hangs along like a slave because she can't get out of that marriage. Whereas Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala legislated and made ease in this religion where if things go difficult, then the marriage can be brought to an end. Is that clear? Um, of course, anything that comes to an end uh, is not easy. It's not easy. And likewise, a relationship as big as marriage, for it to come to an end is extremely difficult. But uh, some of the ways to overcome this is through patience, but also to have good companionship of good friends who you can speak to and consult. Right? To find good people to sit with and speak with because oftentimes people who end up in divorce they also end up in depression because they've got nobody to release with and nobody to speak with yeah and number three people who end up in divorce they should not give up on marriage oftentimes people who get divorced they say that's it never again but it's not the case like that why? Because khair is in marriage. If it didn't work out one time, then you have to, you should try again. Maybe perhaps the second time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send you somebody better. Maybe the third time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send you somebody better. We don't know where khair lies for us. We don't know where khair lies for us. Right? But we should never give up on this opportunity that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. Okay, about divorce. Um, I have a friend um, who just talked recently uh, about divorce. Um, and the reason behind that, they say that their goals aren't common. How important it is, uh, is it to have common goals uh, in marriage? Very important. Because if you don't have common goals, then it seems like the spouses are on different motorways, in different directions, and that's a big problem. Right? Uh, uh, so, uh, common goals, the first goal in marriage should be that uh, to, to create harmony, peace, comfort and love in this marriage. Right? Then people have their own styles of life, own trends in life, own ways in life. 
those ways and trends might be uh, different between the two spouses, but somehow they have to bring them together. But sometimes people are stubborn and they don't want to bring them together. They want to say, no, I just want it my way. And the other says, no, I, I want it my way. So if, if it's just my way and my way, then you should just go your ways. So, so compromising between two, those two then can get you. Uh, Sorry? Compromising between your way and my way yes. can get us to two as Yes, of course, one needs to compromise. right? In reality, both of them should compromise to come to a common ground. But if one becomes stubborn, then the other one should compromise the extra. No. And the problem is that if they don't have common goals as husband and wife, then when they have children, their children also see that the father is going in one direction, the mother is going in another direction. So then they end up in a, a split relationship between their parents, which is also problematic. Um, talking about um, compromising uh, symbols, etc. in a marriage, um, let's say uh, uh, after a painful event, one a couple uh, managed to resolve and move on. How do uh, one? Act, how do does one of the party actually forgive and forget uh, the mistake uh, that was done by the spouse? And how do we actually um, erase the painful memory and mm. on, never mention it again? This is quite difficult. You know, um, I've had cases of abusive marriages. Recently I had a case of uh, a woman who was in an abusive marriage for about 13, 14 years. Right? And a seriously abusive marriage. And she, she was a very pious woman. At the end of it, alhamdulillah, she was able to uh, speak to the authorities and come out of this marriage and, and move on. And the Qadi gave her talaq and everything. Uh, but nevertheless, she still feels that she has to speak about her experiences to get that out of her, right? It's not always easy just to keep it within them. So sometimes, this is why it's very important to have good friends or, or understanding relatives and family members who people can speak to and just get, get that out of them, right? Uh, because sometimes it just builds up and if you don't release it, it can cause major damage within a person. At the same time, uh, pe uh, a person, these types of people, they need good counseling, right? They need good religious counseling, whereby uh, they try to forget and move on. If not forget, at least move on, try to uh, find their, their way in life, uh, try to find another relationship, try, try <coughs> do something which is active, right? You know, one of the reasons why people end up very depressed after the breakup of these relationships is because they don't actually physically do anything in life. They just sit around pondering upon what's happened to them. Of course, it's natural that thoughts will come to them of what's happened to them. But if they engage themselves and make themselves busy, uh, it will help them move along in life. What if I combine um, in the situation of this anger, angry husband um, who has anger management and if let's say, um, like the situation that you just mentioned, she managed to get up from the relationship, but what if she can't because the husband checked her in a certain way? Uh, what because the husband? Uh, the husband threats her. Uh, threats her. Yeah, okay. threats her. Um, in a certain way that she uh, don't have the guts to actually go to a party and ask for a talak. What are the rights so in this case? Or she, the only solution is just to go? Uh, you see, uh, women need to become brave, right? Especially in the times that we live in. When things are abusive, they need to become brave. The case that I said, had this woman built up the courage to go out some years earlier, perhaps things would have been easier for her. But sometimes what happens is women delay things, say, oh, maybe he'll get better, maybe things will change. But years pass, that never happens. 
So women need to really build up the courage to go and speak to the Qadi. Right? Go and speak to the authorities. Because nobody, uh, nobody has to put up with abuse. Nobody has to put up with abuse. Is that clear? And especially this type of abuse that leaves scars in the heart and in the mind for years to come. Uh, while we are in the topic, so what if the marriage have some things like uh, extramarital affairs, where one of the spouses have a affair outside the relationship with somebody else, like emotional or maybe physical? So what is the couple to do when, when if they decided to reconcile the reconcile the marriage? How, how do they move on from that? I mean, how to rebuild the trust between them? What what they are supposed to do? Uh, to rebuild the trust based upon Tawbah, right? Uh, based upon repentance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if one repents from a sin, then the other should think like this, that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts the repentance of a person, to such an extent that the man who killed 99 and then completed the 100, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave that person. If Allah azza wa jal is ready to accept the tawbah of this person, then I should follow in the character of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is for people who want to keep that relationship. They have to start thinking like this and think that people make mistakes, people, you know, um, fall into sin. But if this person has now made tawbah between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we all are sinful people. Nobody is immune of sin. When we forgive people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive us. Like uh, Sayyidina Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu an. He used to spend money upon poor people. And one day he found out that one of the poor people he used to spend money on was from amongst those who spoke against Sayyida Aisha radiallahu anha. So he took a qasam that he will never spend upon this person ever again. That person made tawbah from his accusations, wrong accusations of Sayyida Aisha. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed a Quranic verse saying to Sayyidina Abu Bakr that it does not befit you to take a qasam that you will stop giving these people. Uh, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, you should overlook and forgive. أَلَا تُحِبُّونَ أَنْ يَغْفِرَ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ Don't you like it for yourself that Allah forgives you? So if you like it for yourself that if Allah forgives you and overlooks and erases your sins, then this is the same way that we should live with others, even if they are our spouses. They have greater right that we, we behave like this with them than anybody else, even though it's much more difficult. right? When we find out that somebody very close to us has made some of these mistakes, it's more difficult for us. But what we should remember is, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ready to forgive, then we should be ready to forgive also. Okay, there's another question from uh, the audience. Some way you uh, If a spouse dreams and doesn't pray, uh, it has been years, but he still expects me to respect him uh, or her. Uh, and am I obligated to be obedient towards him? And uh, can you share some tips on how uh, to be guide him? So if the husband doesn't pray and drinks, and these are two personal sins. These are two personal sins between that person and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are not sins towards the spouse, towards the wife, for example. Right? So if the husband doesn't pray and drinks, the the wife should still be obedient unto him so long as he does not order her, instruct her to do that which is impermissible, right? That's number one. Number two, the wife should try to help him 
in his religion, uh, in practicing religion. So uh, encourage him to pray uh, and speak to him about the benefits of prayer, speak to him about the harms of drinking and so on and so forth. No. Because these are not sins uh, that are towards the wife per se. Uh, these are more personal between him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the wife should still be obedient unto him. No. Um, before we go, uh, can I have the last question? To some of the things, how does a couple stay happily married? How does a couple stay happily married? Keep smiling. <laughs> Keep smiling, loving each other. Um, you see, uh, we really have to be careful of the world that we live in now. We live in a very dangerous world. When people are married, they have to understand that they become one unit. And that unit should try to operate together in everything that it does, right? Soon as they deviate from each other, as soon as they part from each other, then the shaitan will start to break them up. And what we have to remember is we have shayateen al-jinni wal-ins. You have the shayateen that whisper into your mind and then you have the shayateen from amongst the people who when they see that your marriage is harmonious and your marriage is filled with affection and love, they want to break it up, right? You have jealous people, you have envious people, right? So for this reason, the husband and wife, when they come together in marriage, they should know that we have to become one unit uh, for the rest of our lives, right? We have to become one unit. And once they understand that, uh, this, is the, this is the fundamental, basic uh, component of a happy marriage is that they need to understand we are one unit. We can't be thinking separately, we can't be doing separately, we have to be doing together, we have to be thinking together uh, and our goals and objectives of life have to be the same because we are married in one unit. Right? Um, nowadays in the world that we live in, people are very individual. They like to express their individuality in everything that they do. And that's one of the major reasons why things are kind of not working out for people. Because everybody, people have become very hot-headed in, uh, uh, in, in portraying their own ways and their own styles and keeping away uh, from this notion of being one unit, right? Um, other than that, other than being one unit, then it's important in the times that we live in that the spouses engage in activities together. When I say activities, that's other than what they do in their own homes. Like for example, it's important that people go out together and not only to restaurants, right? I would discourage people to go to restaurants. Nevertheless, I would encourage people to go out, but not to restaurants, right? I would, huh? To this program, maybe. To this program. I would encourage people to go on retreats, to go on trips like mountain climbing, go into the nature, go to the seaside, right? Do physical activities together, right? I would uh, encourage uh, spouses to do sports together. You know, uh, a week ago, I was working in my, two weeks ago, I was working in my house and I had a friend who's a builder and um, he came to help me out, he came to help me out in, 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 in the work. And then he said, oh, I'm going with my wife, we go skiing together, right? He said, we go skiing together and we're in the same class learning how to ski. And then he said something very important to me. He said, he said you have to do something together, which is physical, at least once or twice a week that you're looking forward to as a husband and wife, right? 
Uh, why I don't encourage people to go to restaurants is because you have a restaurant at home, you have a kitchen, right? You can cook your food. Sometimes a husband can cook, sometimes a wife can cook, right? Whereas people need to get out and do exciting things together, right? And uh, this is something that the Muslims need to really learn from the West too. Uh, how people uh, engage in, in physical activities together, right? Uh, things like canoeing, uh, mountain climbing, uh, uh, cycling, uh, walking, going to the seaside. You know, activities like this stimulate the mind and are good for the body. Right? Stimulate the mind and are good for the body and bring relaxation to the soul. Right? To go on trips together, uh, to, to visit different countries together. Things like this are very important. And then to engage in some type of education together also. Right? So if there is uh, some courses that are going on, then husband and wife should go together to study that course. And then later on sit together in exchanging notes, in exchanging ideas and, and, and things like this. These, so the husband and wife should have certain things that they do together outside of the house, which are stimulating, which are motivating, which are uh, good for, for the body, mind and for the health. Right, um, so uh, so that they look forward to things like that uh, throughout the week or once a month and things like this, uh, and I think that that's a very important component in a happy marriage. Also, number three, uh, uh, what's very important in a happy marriage is that you keep your private affairs private. And they are not, they don't even reach your parents, her parents, you don't, they don't reach your relatives, nor do they reach her relatives. And this is not only in matters which are private and which might be problematic or argumentation and things, even in matters which you are both happy about. Even in matters which you are both excited about, you should try not to announce too much of your happiness. Why? Because the Prophet said, The evil eye is true. And, and you know, uh, my mother says, most of the time that evil eye strikes is when people are happy with what you're doing. Right? When people see you in... in Goodness, they get happy for you and this poison comes out of the eye and strikes and that's it, it's all gone. Right? So even in matters that you're happy with, you shouldn't announce them. Nowadays you have people, as soon as they are engaged, they put it on Facebook. When they are married, they put it on Facebook. When they conceive the first child, they put it on Facebook. The nine months that the, the, the wife is going to get the scans in the hospital, they take the pictures and put it on Facebook. Right? This, you should keep your lives private. Uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, إِسْتَعِينُوا عَلَىٰ قَضَاءِ حَوَائِجِكُمْ بِالْكِتْمَانِ Take assistance from concealing your affairs in fulfilling them. If you want to fulfill your affairs and matters, conceal them, keep them private, and keep them hidden from the eyes of others. Right? Uh, so this is also very important. Is there anything you would add? Is there anything you want to add? No, no, no. no. This is a panel. Uh, it looks like I'm, I'm the only one who's getting drilled. <laughs> I think you've given us a lot of, uh, lot of information already. What do you think? Uh, I'm not asking for questions, I'm asking for suggestions. Uh, I have none. <laughs> Yourself? Okay. Um, well, noted, uh, going to restaurants might not be one of the best ways. Um, but sometimes it's difficult when you, because you mentioned a lot of uh, outdoor activities, uh, trekking, running, um, cycling, etc. But if, let's say, your spouse is not into that so much, um, a bit more indoor, like reserve, and going to restaurants in particular. We didn't have a lot of choice, but 
Uh, so I think just have to balance it out and like uh, instead, so if, if, if they li like going to restaurants, I would change that to going on picnics. Okay. okay. Right? That's refreshing. Yes. yes. So to take your own food and go on a picnic. Okay. Right? To find a, a beautiful... <laughs> What's the joke? <laughs> okay. So... Oh Allah, we ask you that you accept this gathering of Yarrab al Alameen. Oh Allah, we ask you that you enrich our minds and our souls with this religion, Yarrab al Alameen. Oh Allah, we ask you that you make this gathering a means of forgiveness for each and every one of us, Yarrab al Alameen. A means by which you overlook our shortcomings and remove our discrepancies, Yarrab al Alameen. Oh Allah, we ask you that you make this gathering a means of, of goodness. For us in this world and the next world, Ya Rabbul Alameen. Oh Allah, we ask you that through, uh, we ask you that you make this gathering a means of mercy for all of those Muslims who have gone before us from this world, Ya Rabbul Alameen. A means for cure for all of the ill of the Muslims, Ya Rabbul Alameen. A means of relief for all of those in hardship and difficulty, Ya Rabbul Alameen. Oh Allah, we ask you that, uh, we ask you for those who are married that you give them Peace, comfort, love, and harmony in their marriages, Ya Rabbul Alameen. O oh Allah, and make their marriages successful and allow them to have mutual understandings amongst them, Ya Rabbul Alameen. O oh Allah, and we ask you for those who are not married that you, O oh Allah, that you make it easy for them to get married to, to, to people who, to a people who are compatible and full of mercy and love for them, Ya Rabbul Alameen. O oh Allah, we ask you that you make it easy for those who are not married, Ya Rabbul Alameen, that they find the right spouse for themselves, Ya Rabbul Alameen. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fi al-akhirat hasana wa qina adab al Oh Allah, we ask you for this organization that organized uh, this event, uh, uh, that you give them strength in, in, in their efforts and in their intentions, Ya Rabbul Alameen. O oh Allah, we ask you that you allow them to help those in difficulty and in hardship in their marriages, Ya Rabbul Alameen, and make them a means by which uh, this institution of nikah and marriage is saved, Ya Rabbul Alameen. Subhanahu Rabbika Rabbil Azzati Amma Yasufun. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.